The Faroe Islands. The Faroe Islands are a part of the world that you probably don't even know exists. North of Britain, south of Iceland, east of Scandinavia? That can't be right. A certain direction from Scandinavia. I, uh, I'm making this video because I find them kind of interesting, so this video is going to be me explaining the entire history of the Faroe Islands, or at least reading the entire Wikipedia article. I think it's cool, so that's why I'm doing it. Uh, thank you so much for clicking on this video and for watching, and without further ado, let's get into the meat and fucking tendies of this. Buckle your fuckles, get cozy, send your dad to the Shadow Realm, the whatnot. Here we go. <clears throat> we start in the early Gaelic and Norse settlements. There is some evidence of settlement of on the Faroe Islands before Norse Viking settlers arrived in the 9th century AD. Scientific researchers found burnt grains of domesticated barley and peat ash deposited in two phases, the first dated between the mid-4th and mid-6th centuries and another between the late 6th and late 8th centuries. Researchers have also found sheep DNA in lake bed settlements, which sediments, yeah, you know how to speak, which were dated to around the year 500. Barley and sheep had to have been brought to the islands by humans, as Scandinavians did not begin using the sail until about 750 AD. It is a, or BC, I don't know. It just says 750. It is unlikely that they could have reached the Faroes before then, and it is more likely that the settlers came from the British Isles. Archaeologist Mike Church suggested that the people living there might have been from Ireland, Scotland, or Scandinavia, or potentially all three. <clears throat> According to a 9th century voyage tale, the Irish Saint Brendan visited the islands resembling the Faroes in the 6th century. This description, however, is not conclusive. The earliest text, which has been claimed to be a description of the Faroe Islands, was written by the Irish monk Dicule. How the fuck do you say that? Well, now I've got to read the little the little Wikipedia blurb. Diculeus. All right, hold on. I'm going to Google this. A little bit later. God damn it. Fucking lingerie. Again. Stop it. Please. A few moments later. Okay. The first description of the Faroe Islands was written by the Irish monk D.Q. Will. That's how you pronounce it according to the Danish pronunciation, so we'll go with that. Now this was circa 825 in his work, Liber de Mansura Orbis Terrae, Description of the Sphere of Earth. Get fucking owned, Flat Earthers. Goddamn, this man shat on you before it was even scientifically and mathematically discovered according to the broad, widely accepted date of that. Anyway. Dequil had met a man worthy of trust who related to his master, the abbot Sweeney. Now, of course, he had landed on the islands in the far north after sailing two days and a summer night in a little vessel of two banks of oars in Dubus Estavius Dibus et Una. What? Are you just speaking in fucking Latin to me? I am not summoning a demon for you. Anyway, many other islands lie in the northerly British Ocean. One reaches them from the northerly islands of Britain by sailing directly for two days and two nights with a full sail and favorable wind the whole time. Most of these islands are small, they're separated by narrow channels, and for nearly a hundred years hermits lived there, coming from our land, Ireland, by boat. But just as these islands have been uninhabited from the beginning of the world, so now the Norwegian pirates have driven away the monks. But countless sheep and many different species of sea fowl are to be found there. Norse settlement of the Faroe Islands is recorded in the Feringa Saga, whose original manuscript is lost. Portions of the tale were inscribed in three other sagas, such as Fleitjerbach, Saga of Olafjörd Tryggvason, and AM62 FOL. I butchered those pronunciations. I am so sorry to any Scandinavian people. Luckily, I don't have to worry about triggering the Danish people, because as we all know, the Netherlands do not exist. Now, the historical credibility of the Faranga Saga is highly questioned. That just means it's super cool, bro. Both the saga of Olafur Tryggvason and the Fleitjerbach claim that Grimir Kamban was the first man to discover the Faroe 
islands. The two sources disagree, however, on the year in which he left and the circumstances of his departure. Fletjerbach details the immigration of Grumir Kiban at some time during the reign of Harald Hagerfer between 872 and 930 AD. The saga of Olafir Tryggvason indicates that the Kamban was residing in the Faroes long before the rule of Harald Hagrifer, Harfiger, Harfiger, and that the other Norse were driven to the Faroe Islands due to his chaotic rule. This mass migration to the Faroe Islands shows a prior knowledge of the Viking settlement's locations, furthering the claim of Grimir Kamban's settlement as much earlier. While Kamban is recognized as the first Viking settler of the Faroe Islands, his surname is of Gaelic origin. Writings from the Papar, in order of Irish monks, show that they left the Faroe Islands due to ongoing Viking raids. And this takes us to pre-14th century, right in the middle of the Dark Ages, the European Dark Ages. The Middle East was actually doing really fucking good during the Dark Ages. And then shit stopped doing so good. But that's for a different video. The name of the islands is first recorded on the Hereford Mapa Mundi 1280, where they're labeled Foray. The name has long been understood as based on Old Norse far livestock, and thus Farrer, Farrer, how the fuck do you even say that? Basically, sheep islands. The main historical source for this period is a 13th century work, Faringa Saga, Saga of the Faroese, Though it is disputed as to how much of this work is historical fact, which again means that that is super cool and there's totally awesome lore, and they fought robots. Maybe, I don't know. The Faranga Saga only exists today as copies in other sagas. In particular, the manuscripts called the Saga of Olafir Tryggvason and the Fleitjerbach and one registered as AM62FOL, which we have already talked about. According to the, we've also already talked about when Grimir Kamban settled. Next. More gibberish. How, who gave people permission to speak? What the fuck is this? What the fuck? What the fuck is this? That is not funny. That is not, there's nothing... The text suggests that Grimir Kanban settled in the Faroes sometime before the flight from Harald Hafager, perhaps even hundreds of years before, and his first near name, Grimir, is Norse, but his last, Kanban, suggests a Gaelic origin. He may have been of mixed Norse and Irish origin, and could have come from a settlement in the British Isles, a so-called Norse Gael. The Norse Gaels had intermarried with speakers of Irish, a language also spoken at the time in Scotland, being the ancestor of Scottish Gaelic. Having a mixed cultural background and later settlers may be found in the Norse-Irish ringpins found in the Faroe Islands, and in features of Faroese vocabulary. Examples of such words derived from Middle Irish are Black, Blauk, Buttermilk, Irish, uh, Blakath, Draner, animal tail, Irish, Duran, uh, also pronounced Chine, what? Rukur, head, Irish, Rag, hair, Iamur, hand, paw, Irish, I am, hand, Tver, bowl, Irish, tarb, and Ayergi, pasture in the outfield, and Irish, Ayergi, rye, milking place, modern Irish, Ayeri, yep, well, Okay, we're done with that bit for now. That's me butchering Norse and Gaelic words. Languages don't exist. They're not real. This is it's all just a bunch of monkeys making shit up, man. The discovery at the Toftanes at the Estuary of Wooden Div Divon... This word's giving me a hard time, man. Devotional, there we go, crosses apparently modeled on Irish or Scottish exemplars suggest that some of the settlers were Christian, because as we all know, our big man Jesus Christ and his girthy schmeat have been spread all over the planet for all of time. And if you disagree, the church would burn you alive, but now laws prevent that, luckily. It has also been suggested that the typical curvilinear stone built walls enclosing the earlier classes. Why are words like this? <laughs> Early ecclesiastical sites in the Faroes, as in North Settlements elsewhere, reflect a Celtic Christian style seen in the circular enclosures of early ecclesiastical sites in Ireland. 
Indirect support for this theory has been found in genetic research showing that many Norse settler women in the Faroe Islands had Celtic forebearers. Norse women? We love Norse women. Tall women. My favorite. If there was a settlement in the Froes in the reign of Harald Hefarger, it is possible that people already knew about the Froes because of people who had been there beforehand. No shit. The fact that immigrants from Norway also settled in the Faroe Islands is proven by a rune stone, uh, see Sandvager stone, found in the village of Sandvager on Vagoy Island. And it says, Thorkel Onondson, Eastman, Norwegian, from Rogaland, settled it first in this place. Sand of Vagar. This description, Eastman from Norway, has to be seen together with the description Westman from Ireland and Scotland, which is found to be a local place name such as Vestmanahaven, i.e. Irishman's Harbor, and the Faroe Isles, and Vestmanjar, Irishman's Islands, in Iceland, because Iceland is surprisingly a place. Believe it or not, Iceland is real. It, it has that stamp of approval from me. According to the Faranga Saga, there was an ancient institution on the headland called Tiganes in Torsuan on the island of Stremoy. This was Alping or Althing, all council. This was a place where the laws were made and the beef was resolved. If you did not like somebody, you went to the all council. All free men had the right to meet in the all thing, and the parliament and court for all is what it served as, thus the name all council. Historians estimate the All Council to have been established from 800 to 900, I'm going to presume AD. The islands were officially converted to Christianity around the year 1000, yeah totally, with the diocese of the Faroe Islands based in Kirkpior, southern Stremoy, of which there were 33 Catholic bishops. Well, I mean, that's impressive that they even got there considering bishops can only move diagonally. The Faroes became part of the Kingdom of Norway in 1035. Early in the 11th century, Sigmund or Sigmund or Bretison, whose family had flourished in the Southern Islands, but had been almost exterminated by invaders from the north, was sent from Norway to where he had escaped to take possession of the islands for Olaf Tryggvason, King of Norway. He introduced Christianity, and though he was subsequently murdered, Norwegian supremacy was upheld and continued. Yeah, that's right, random dude. Get fucking murdered. See you later, Sigmund. King Sverre of Norway had br been brought up in the Faroes, being a stepson of a Faroese man, and was relative to Ro, Bishop of the Islands. That's a weird name, Ro. And now we have Foreign Commercial Interest, 14th Century to Second World War. That's a lot of time. <laughs> The 14th century saw the start of what would prove to be a long era of foreign encroachment on the Faroese economy. What economy? Grass? At this time, trading regulations were set up so that all Faroese commerce had to pass through Bergen, Norway, in order to collect customs tax. Because, you know, if you fucking exist, I guess the government has a right to some of your money, the sacks of shit. The Hanseatic League was gaining in power, threatening Scandinavian commerce. Though Norway tried to halt this, it was forced to desist after, you know, the Black Death and the subsequent decimation of population. That's no big deal, really. <laughs> Norwegian supremacy continued until 1380 when the islands became part of the Kalmar Union. What the fuck is that? Great question. I myself did not know. The Kalmar Union was a personal union in Scandinavia, agreed at Kalmar in Sweden, that from 1397 to 1523 joined under a single monarch the three kingdoms of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, together with Norway's overseas colonies. Because we love imperialism, the islands were still a possession of the Norwegian crown since the crowns had not been joined. In 1380, the Althing, All Council, was named the Logting, though it was now little more than a court, really. In the 1390s, Henry I Sinclair, Henry I Sinclair, Earl of Orkney, took possession of the islands as a vassal of Norway. However, and for some time, they were part of the Sinclair Principality in the North Atlantic. Archaeological excavations on the island include sustained pig keeping up to and beyond the 13th century, a unique situation when compared to Iceland and Greenland. The Faroese at Giancarinsufati, I hope I said that right, but I probably didn't, remained dependent upon bird resources, especially puffins, far longer and to a greater degree than any of the other Viking age 
where does that sentence go? Settlers of the North Atlantic Islands. English adventurers gave great trouble to the inhabitants in the 16th century, the same way that English adventurers caused problems all over the fucking world, for whatever reason, for a few centuries. And the name of Magnus Heinesen, a native of Stramoy, who was sent by Frederick II to clear the seas, is still celebrated in many local songs and stories. Then we have the Reformation Era. In 1535, Christian II, the deposed monarch, tried to regain power from King Christian III, who had just succeeded his father, Frederick I. Several of the powerful German companies backed Christian II, but eventually he lost, because this was before corporations ruled the world, silly. In 1537, the new king, Christian III, gave the German trader Thomas Kolpen exclusive trading rights in the Faroes. Exclusive. Except for piracy. These rights were subject to the following conditions. Only good quality goods, only good quality goods, no bad quality goods, were to be supplied by the Faroes and were to be made in numbers proportionate to the rest of the market. Yeah, that makes sense. We can have these little ass islands just pump out the same as big cities. Totally. The goods were to be bought at their market value, and the traders were to deal fairly and honestly with the Faroes. Christian III also introduced Lutheranism to the Faroes to replace Catholicism, because get the fuck out of here, Pope! This process took five years to complete, in which time Danish was used instead of Latin, good, get out of here, Pope, whatever Pope was in at the time, and church property was transferred to the state. The bish... How the fuck do... What is that word? The bishopric at Kirkjibauer, south of Torshvan, where remains of the cathedral may be seen, was also abolished. After Koppen, others took over the trading monopoly through the... And though the economy suffered as a result of the Dano-Swedish war between Denmark and Norway and Sweden, during this period of the monopoly, most of the Faroese goods, wool, products, fish, and meat were taken to the Netherlands. Wrong! No! The Netherlands do not fucking exist! Danish is not a language! Now, here they were sold at predetermined prices, because even though, like the Queen of England, the Netherlands do not exist, they were not fair in their dealings. The guidelines of the trading agreement, however, were often ignored or corrupted, and this caused delays and shortages in the supply for always goods and a reduction in quality. With the trading monopoly nearing collapse, smuggling and piracy were rife. We love to see it. Crime? I'm all about that shit, baby. Piracy? Let's fucking go. I love it. Now, 1600s onwards. The Danish king tried to solve the problem by giving the Faroes to the courtier Christopher Gable and later his son Frederick as a personal feudal state. However, the Gable rule was harsh and repressive, breeding much resentment in the Faroese revolution. I hope so. This caused Denmark-Norway in 1708 to entrust the islands and trading monopoly once more to the central government. However, they too struggled to keep the economy going, and many merchants were trading at a loss. Finally, on the 1st of January, 1856, the trading monopoly was abolished, because monopolies are bullshit and don't deserve to exist. The Faroe Islands, Iceland, and Greenland became a part of Denmark at the Peace of Kiel in 1814, when the Union of Denmark and Norway was dissolved. In 1816, the Logting, the Faroese Parliament, was officially abolished and replaced by a Danish judiciary. Danish was introduced as the main language, whilst Faroese was discouraged. In 1849, a new constitution came to use in Denmark and was promulgated in the Faroes in 1850, giving the Faroes two seats in the Rigsdag, Danish parliament. The Faroes, however, managed in 1852 to re-establish the Logting as a county council with an advisory role, with many people hoping for eventual independence. The late 19th century saw increasing support for the home rule independence movement, though not all were in favor. Meanwhile, the Faroese economy was growing with the introduction of large-scale fishing. That's a temporary thing. The Faroese were allowed access to large Danish waters in the North Atlantic, and living standards subsequently improved. There was also a population increase, though Faroese was standardized as a written language in 1890. It was not allowed to be used in public schools until 1938, or in the church, whatever the fuck that word is, until 1939. What does that take us now? World War II, baby. During the Second World War, Denmark was invaded and occupied by Nazi Germany. 
The British suddenly, subsequently made a preemptive invasion and occupation of the Faroes, known as Operation Valentine, to prevent a German invasion. That seems a little shitty. Given their strategic location in the North Atlantic, the Faroes could have proved useful to Germany in the Battle of the Atlantic, possibly as a submarine base. Instead, British forces built an airbase on Vigar, which is still in use as Vigar Airport. Faroese fishing boats also provided a large amount of fish to the UK, which was crucial given food rationing. The Log Team gained legislative powers, with the Danish prefect Carl H. Hilbert retaining executive power. The Faroese flag, however, was recognized by British authorities, and on screen right there is the flag of the Faroe Islands. It's an offset of the cross, because Jeebus Criminus, he's everywhere. <clears throat> there were some attempts to declare complete independence during this period, but the UK had given an undertaking not to interfere in the internal affairs of the Faroe Islands, nor to act without the permission of a liberated Denmark. The experience of wartime self-government was crucial in paving the way for formal autonomy in 1948. The British presence was broadly popular, particularly given the alternative of a Nazi-German occupation, and approximately 150 marriages took place between British soldiers and Faroese women. That's because Scandinavian women are hot. Women are hot. I love women. Now, although the scale of the British presence on Vigar did lead to some local tensions, the British presence also left a lasting popularity for British chocolate and sweets, which is readily available in Faroese shops, but uncommon in Denmark. And then, you know, World War II happened, that guy shot himself, Joseph Stalin, he did some things. Uh, Cold War? Yes, sir. But now we have post-World War II. We're not worried about the global economy or stage, we're just worried about these tiny little islands. Following the liberation of Denmark and the end of World War II, the last British troops left in September of 1945, and until 1948, the Faroes had the official status of a Danish Amt county. A referendum on full independence was held in 1946, which produced majority in favor. This, however, was not recognized by the Danish government or king due to only two-thirds of the population participating in the referendum, so the Danish king abolished the government of the Faroes. What? The subsequent elections in the Logting were run by anti-independence majority, and instead a high degree of self-governance was attained in 1948 with the passing of the Act of Faroese Home Rule. Faroese is now an official language, though Danish is still taught as a second language in schools, and the Faroese flag is also officially recognized by the Danish authorities. In 1973, Denmark joined the European Community, now known as the European Union, and the Faroes refused to join, mainly over the issue of fishing limits, because, you know, when your entire economy is built on fish, that might be a little bit of a problem. The 1980s saw an increase in support for Faroese independence, unemployment was very low, and the Faroese were enjoying one of the world's highest standards of living, but the Faroese economy was almost entirely reliant on fish, and the early 90s saw a dramatic slump in fish stocks because of this neat little thing known as, oh shit, we took all the fish out of the oceans, with new high-tech equipment. During the same time period, the government was also engaged in massive overspending. Uh oh. National debt was now at 9.4 billion Danish krones, DKK. And finally, in October 1992, the Faroese National Bank called in receivers and was forced to ask Denmark for a huge financial bailout. Who's independent now, bitch? The initial sum was uh, 500 million DKK, though this eventually grew to 1.8 billion. And this was a, in addition to the annual 1 billion grant that the Faroe Islands received. Austerity measures were introduced, public spending was cut, there was a tax and VAT increase on public employees, and they were also given a 10% wage cut. Much of the fishing industry was put into receivership with talk of cutting down the number of fish farms and ships. It was during this period that many Faroese, 6%, decided to emigrate men mainly to Denmark. Unemployment skyrocketed to up to as much as 20% in Torsotron, with it being higher in the outlying islands. In 1993, the Sovjetunion Bank, what the fuck, merged with the Faroe Islands' second largest bank, Faroe Banki. A third was declared bankrupt. Meanwhile, there was growing international boycott of Faroese products because of a whaling issue. 
The independence movement dissolved on the one hand, while Denmark found itself left with the Fro Islands unpaid bills on the other. That's a genius play. Want to be independent and sell you go into debt, and then force a nation that owns you to pay that debt off, because it's their problem now. Recuperative measures were put in place and it largely worked. Unemployment did peak in January 1994 in 26%, but you know what else you could find in January of 1994? An R32 GTR Skyline, my favorite car. This whole YouTube thing does not end until I own one of those. Now, after that, it fell, the unemployment rate, that is, 10% in mid-1996, 5% in April of 2000, and the fishing industry likely survived intact. Fish stocks also rose, with the annual catch being 100,000 in 94, rising to 150,000 in 95, and in 98, it was 375,000. Immigration also fell to 1% in 95, and there was a small population increase in 1996, uh oh, people be fucking. In addition, oil was discovered nearby, which, as we all know, means that America has to bring them some good old red, white, and blue freedom, baby. Now, by the early 21st century, weaknesses in the Faroese economy had been eliminated, and accordingly, many minds once again turned to the possibility of independence from Denmark. However, a planned referendum in 2001 on first steps towards independence was called off following Danish Prime Minister Paul Nyrup Rasmussen saying that Danish money grants would be phased out within four years if there was a yes vote. Genius play. And that is the entire brief history of the Faroe Islands. I enjoyed making this video. Hopefully my editor enjoyed being let out of the basement to edit this video. Uh, big preach to my editor. If you like this stuff, you should go thank her in the comments or just subscribe to her channel. And once again, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this or you like history and stuff or you just like me talking and my humor, uh, go ahead and just subscribe. You're clearly mildly bored. I'm clearly mildly entertaining. We can really help each other here. It's like a circle jerk, but not as homosexual. And, of course, once again, thank you so much for watching. If you're new here, just subscribe. I already told you why. If you're not new here and you want to support the channel more, you can subscribe to the Patreon. It's $3 a month for the lowest tier. Helps me greatly. If you can't, that's okay. Just make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff. Once again, for like the fourth time, thank you for watching, have a great time, and until next time, memento mori.